uh, this morning I want to focus our attention on uh, the theme of uh, mission priority. It's harvest time. Uh, this will be our theme for the next five years. And uh, we want to look at it uh, from an angle with a simple idea, uh, simply saying that God is in the business of sending people on mission. God is in the business of sending people on mission. And if you like uh, titles for sermons, I have entitled my message, The God Who Sends, The God Who Sends. I invite you to turn to the Gospel according to John, the Gospel according to John, the 20th chapter, chapter 20, starting from verse 19. John chapter 20, starting from verse 19. Uh, this episode, you know, takes place after the resurrection. Uh, when Jesus appears in the flesh to his disciples. And the Bible says in verse 19 that in the evening of that first day of the week, the disciples were gathered together with the doors locked because of their fear of the Jews. Then Jesus came, stood among them, and said to them, Peace to you. There's already a message here. We don't need to fear when Jesus is in the building. Because when he is in the building, he will speak peace to our hearts. But this is not the sermon. Let me continue. The Bible adds, having said this, he showed them his hands and his side. So the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. When Jesus speaks peace to your heart, you have peace indeed. Then Jesus adds those very important words which are the basis for this sermon. He said, As the Father has sent me, I also send you. You cannot go unless you have peace, and you cannot go unless Jesus sends you. This morning I want to draw our attention to two main points. First point, mission begins with God. This is my first point. No, I was a teacher before, so I like saying number one, number two. But it's only two points. First point, mission begins with God. Number two. The church exists for mission. Very basic, very simple. The first point I want to emphasize this morning is that mission begins with God. This point might seem obvious to all of us, but too often do we miss it when we are planning for mission. Mission does not begin with a committee. Mission does not begin with a board action. Mission does not begin with a church program. Mission begins with God. From the beginning of Scripture, we see God involved in mission. First of all, seeking for His lost children in the Garden of Eden. Calling them, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? And God has been on mission ever since. His voice echoing through space and time, calling his children, Where are you? We see God involved in mission when he called Abraham so that the human race would be blessed through him. We see God calling Israel into existence for mission to be a light to the nations. We see God calling people here, calling people there. God asking Jonah, who shall I send? 
and Jonah saying, not me. God calling Isaiah for mission and saying, whom shall I send? And Isaiah answering, here I am, send me. God is involved in mission from the beginning. Most importantly, we see God involved in mission when he entered human history himself in the person of Jesus Christ. In Christ, God drew near in mission. In Christ, God's mission reached another level. He came down himself. He did not delegate this plan or this phase of mission to anybody else. He did not delegate it to an angel or to a prophet or to a preacher. God came himself. God the Father sent God the Son through God the Holy Spirit so that the entire Godhead would bring humanity back to God. This is the kind of God we serve. How did it look like when God came down for mission? What did it look like when he came down to do mission? What happens when God is on mission? You remember when Jesus came down, when Jesus started his ministry, when he came to church one day and they handed him the scroll, he turned to the book of Isaiah and read from the scroll, and it is written in Luke 4, verse 17, that unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, the Spirit of God is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then the Bible says that uh, he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The Bible adds that the eyes of everyone was fixed on him. And then he said, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. What happened when God came down to do mission? When God came down to do mission, he ministered in the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me. There is no mission without God's anointing. What happened when God came down to do mission? When God came down to do mission, the good news was proclaimed. There is no mission without the good news. Jesus said that he came down to proclaim the good news to the poor. Not bad news, but good news. Not sad news, but good news. Not scary news, but good news. What happened when God came down to do mission? When God came down to do mission, the good news was not only proclaimed, it was also enacted. The gospel was not only preached, it was also performed. In Jesus, the good news became flesh and dwelt among us. In Jesus, we see not only a messenger of the good news, we see the message of the good news itself. Jesus was the good news, and Jesus is still the good news. When God comes down to do mission, great things happen. The blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear, the dumb speak, those with leprosy are cleansed, the captives and the oppressed are set free, the dead are raised. When God comes to do mission, great things happen. In Jesus, God came down. In Jesus, God came down to this earth on a rescue mission, a mission of salvation, a mission of redemption. 
a mission to love the unlovable, a mission to heal the incurable, a mission to forgive the unforgivable, a mission that would involve the pain of rejection, the shame of the cross, and the experience of death. When God is on mission, when God comes to do mission, Big things happen. Try to imagine the giver of life dying on a cross. Try to imagine the innocent one suffering for the guilty. Try to imagine the sinless one bearing the sins of the world. When God comes to do mission, big things happen. And the question is, why? Did Jesus have to go through this? Simply because God loves. Simply because God loves and cares for us. And that's why he was willing to come down. Leave the heavenly adoration. To experience the mockery, the rejection and humiliation from the very same ones he came to save. It was loved it was love that propelled him to do mission. And this tells me that without love, we cannot do mission. Without love, we cannot do mission. If our heart is callous and cold, if our heart is indifferent to human suffering, mission cannot be done. Mission cannot take center stage. Mission cannot be a priority. If our heart is not in tune with the heart of God, a loving heart, a caring heart, a heart which is compassionate, reaching down to those who are lost because of love, Jesus was sent on a mission. Because of love, Jesus came down for a mission. And throughout his ministry, Jesus went around doing good knowing deep in his soul that he was sent on a mission by the Father. He knew that the Father had sent him. He knew that he was on planet Earth, not by accident, not for a vacation. He was there on planet Earth for one purpose, to do mission, to save the lost. Why are we on this Earth? Jesus could say in John 3 verse 17, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. He could say in his prayer in John 17 verse 3, Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Mission was Jesus' priority. He knew that the harvest was ready. And that's why he could say to his disciples in John 4 verse 35, I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Mission priority, it's harvest time. And maybe it is good for us to ask a simple question. Who is in charge of mission in God's church? Who is in charge of mission at ECD? Is it Pastor Ruguri? Is it Pastor Okindo? No. It is God himself. God is the one in charge of mission because mission begins with him. He is the source of mission. In his son, God embodied mission and showed us what mission looks like and how we could participate with him in his mission endeavor. And this brings me to the second point. The church exists for mission. Jesus says here, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. 
Jesus is both the sent and the sender. You will realize here that this, those words of Jesus echoes his prayer from John 17 verse 18 when he said to his father, As you have sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. The church exists to participate in God's mission. The church exists to participate in the mission of Christ to reach the lost. This is what we are called to understand, even when we start reading the book of Acts. You remember how Luke started uh, his prologue. He, he, he said, in, in my former book, and you find it in, in Acts 1 verse 1, he said, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. I don't know if you, if you picked that one. He said, all that Jesus began to do and to teach. When Luke was writing uh, this, this letter, Jesus was already in heaven. And he wrote to Theophilus saying, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. Which means that Jesus has not finished with his mission yet. I'm writing about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. This means that Jesus is still on a mission. He's still teaching. He's still healing the sick. He's still liberating the captives. And now, Jesus calls his church, organizes it, empowers it for mission. The church exists to continue the mission that Jesus started. You see, God is in the business of sending people. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. God is gracious. God is good. God is holy. God is also a sender. He sends His people. And sometimes we forget this. As God's people, we are a saint people. We are ambassadors for Christ. And like Paul, we said, we can say, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Certain that God is appealing through us. We plead on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. This is our message. Mission means identification with God's ultimate goal of saving humanity and working out this plan. And Ellen White puts it this way. She says, in the beginning of, of, of the Acts of Apostles, she says, The church is God's appointed agency for the salvation of men. It was organized for service, and its mission is to carry the gospel to the world. This is why we exist. This is why we are having those meetings. We exist for mission. If we miss this point, we have missed everything. If we, if we think we have come here only to vote the budget for next year, we have missed the point completely. If we have come here to simply hear reports, we have missed the point completely. We have come here to organize for mission. We have come here to pray for mission. We have come here so that we can strategize for mission. We who follow Jesus are a saint people. Even as Jesus was sent by the Father, we are also sent by Him. We are a community sent on mission together with God. To keep on doing the ministry of Jesus so that all people and all creation might experience the reconciliation of God. When God calls a people, He calls a people for mission. When God calls a people, when He calls His people into existence, He gives them a mission. There are no people of God without a mission. It's, it does not exist. There is no election without a commission. 
God's call is always a call for action, a call for mission. And God is still in the business of sending people. But the question is, is the church responding? Some churches have turned mission and evangelism into a two weeks program in a year. This is what mission is for some churches. Two weeks program. They have turned mission into a program. They have turned mission into an event. They have turned mission into an activity. When mission is first and foremost not about doing things, but about being the church. When the church is what the church is, must be, when the church is what the church must be, mission becomes natural. Mission flows naturally. Mission becomes a priority. When the church is church, mission becomes a priority. But is it the case today? Are we really focused on mission? Are we on fire for mission? Allow me to read a parable. It is called a parable of a lighthouse. This is a parable that has touched my heart over the years. It simply says, On a dangerous sea coast, where shipwrecks often occur, there was once a crude little life-saving station. The building was just a hut, and there was only one boat. But the few devoted members kept a constant watch over the sea. And with no thought for themselves, they went out day or night, tirelessly searching for the lost. Many lives were saved by this wonderful little station so that it became famous. Some of those who were saved and various others in the surrounding areas wanted to be associated with the station and give of their time and money and effort for the support of its work. Now, boats were bought and new crews were trained. The little life-saving station grew. Some of the new members of the life-saving station were unhappy that the building was so crude and so poorly equipped. They felt that a more comfortable place should be provided as the first refuge of those saved from the sea. So, they replaced the emergency cots with beds and put better furniture in an enlarged building. Now the life-saving station became a popular gathering for its members. And they redecorated it beautifully and furnished it as a sort of a club. Less of the members were now interested in going to sea on life-saving missions. So they hired lifeboat crews to do this work. The mission of life-saving was still given lip service, but most were too busy or lacked the necessary commitment to take part in the life-saving activities personally. About this time, a large ship was wrecked off the coast, and the hired crews brought in both loads of cold, wet, and half-drowned people. They were dirty and sick, and some of them had black skin and make some, spoke some strange language, and the beautiful new club was considerably messed up. So the property committee immediately had a shower house built outside the club where victims of shipwreck could be cleaned up before coming inside. 
At the next meeting, there was a split in the club membership. Most of the members wanted to stop the club's life-saving activities as being unpleasant and a hindrance to the normal life, to the normal life pattern of the club. But some members insisted that life-saving was their primary purpose and pointed out that they were still called a life-saving station. But they were finally voted down and told that if they wanted to save the life of all the various kinds of people who were shipwrecked in those waters, they could begin their own life-saving station down the coast. So they did. As the years went by, the new station experienced the same changes that had occurred in the old. They evolved into a club, and yet another life station was founded. And today, if you visit the seacoast, you will find a number of exclusive clubs along that shore. Shipwrecks are still frequent in those waters. Only now, most of the people drown. Have we turned this church into a club? Have we turned this committee into a cozy group of leaders discussing big ideas? Or is mission still a priority for, for us? What a sad story. Sometimes when I look at the church, I wonder, are we mixing our priorities? When you look at your local church, where do you see trade mission? And yet I still believe that there is hope. I still believe that there are places where people are on fire for God. I want you to watch a small clip. It's a young boy called Matteo. Matthias, he comes from Brazil. And this clip shows us that God is still in the business of sending people. Matthias Suarez is nine years old. From a young age, he was challenged by his church family to bring people to Christ. What I like the most is to work in the church. I have the habit of visiting people. I ask them why they are not coming to church. Or when a person is not yet baptized, I will visit to invite them to church. Then we end our visit with a warm goodbye, and I move on to another house. In a single day, I can visit about three people. At the young age of nine, Mateus has given Bible studies to families and individuals and has brought many to the baptismal waters. But he longs for more. I'm in charge of the children's department, audiovisual and personal ministries. And when I grow up, I want to be a pastor. Today, Mateus is 15 years old and is attending an Adventist high school in preparation for pastoral ministry. At Fa'ama, he gets a quality Christian education and the opportunity to preach during special events and at daily worship meetings to dormitory students. When Mateus arrived at Fa'ama, he looked for individuals to study the Bible with so he could continue to follow Jesus' invitation to mission through one-on-one -on -one Bible study. If God said, go to all the world, we need to go into all the world. Although. There are a lot of places where the gospel is not allowed. Jesus affirms us that even if we die for him, one day we will live with him. And if you are faithful unto death, he will give you the crown of life. Up to now, Matthias has led approximately 979 people to baptism. His goal is to reach 1,000 people by the end of 2015. 
God is still in the business of sending people on mission. Let me quote Ellen White as I close. Acts of the Apostles, page 599. She writes, As Christ sent forth his disciples, so today he sends forth the members of his church. The same power that the apostles had is for them. If they make God their strength, he will work with them, and they shall not labor in vain. Friends, the mission of God hasn't changed. It is still the same. God's presence and power are still there. God has not left us to do mission on our own. The only thing that God is asking from us, and the only thing that we can ask God, is to place the burden of mission on our heart. To remind ourselves each and every day, again and again and again and again, that mission is still God's priority. And it should be the church's priority. It's harvest time. It's harvest time. Let's go out and win souls for Christ. Mission, priority. It's harvest time. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for your love and your kindness, for your grace. We thank you that for the privilege of bringing us here to discuss mission. Father, unless mission becomes a priority for each one of us here, our meeting is a waste of money and a waste of time. We pray that you will put in our heart that desire to win souls for Christ, to put in our heart the desire to do everything to bring people to the cross. We pray that your Holy Spirit will come in a mighty way. Father, if a child of 15 can bring almost a thousand to you and is not being paid to do so, and he does it in his spare time. Father Wu was sitting here. What are we doing? Father, we pray that you will put in our heart that love for others. People are dying around us. And our churches are functioning too often as private clubs for the benefit of its members, not for the salvation of those who are being lost every day. We pray that you will Erase from our heart everything which is not mission-oriented. We pray that you will put in our heart that fire that will burn in our soul so that we will be on fire for you, sharing the good news. Not only in big meetings, but when we also when we come across our neighbors, our friends, even strangers. Father, we pray that you will send the Holy Spirit in a mighty way, that you will transform your church. When we look around us, we see signs of life, but also signs of decay and death. 
Whereas some are on fire, others are just dying. We pray that as leaders, we will do what is necessary to put the church back on track, knowing that mission is our priority and that now we live in the time of harvest. Bless each one of us, for we have prayed in Jesus' name. Amen.